but I think it's hard to make a lot of upside cases for oil. If you look at projections for this year, I think most people are sitting uh, around you know, 70 to 75, maybe up to 80 on, on, on the bullish side. Um, but I don't think anybody is really anticipating oil getting to $100 per barrel this year. Welcome to the show. I'm Wealth Channel co-founder Andy Hagens. You know, despite positive economic news recently, as well as an incredible bull market for stocks, which I think has caught a lot of people by surprise, there's this feeling in the markets that, you know, the rug could be pulled out from underneath us. And it really only takes one potential economic shock uh, to really send us into a recession, such as a spike in energy prices. But oil prices have recently been pushing lower and they've been lately staying in this sort of moderate range. So are we entering a new era of cheap and plentiful oil and energy? Or is this just the calm before the storm, a temporary respite uh, before a long-term global energy shortage? Joining me today to answer these questions is Stacy Morris, head of energy research at Vetify. Stacy, the last time we talked was four months ago, and that seems like an eternity in the oil and gas markets. It, it is. A lot has changed. Um, so it'll be good to kind of catch up and get everybody up to speed with what's changed. Yeah. And, you know, I've been, you know, to, to be blunt with the audience, I've bought into this idea that we might be in for a long term energy shortage, you know, globally because of underinvestment and, you know, some of the policy and political decisions that we're making. And I want, so I want to get into that. I want to get into the oil market. I want to get into the natural gas market and the economy, everything. But I want to start with just big picture. Stacy, what is your view of the current macro economy and financial markets? Where are we in the cycle? Well, you know, I think it feels like things are okay. Um, you know, I think if things were worse, the Fed would probably not be as, you know, kind of patient as they're being in, in terms of doing something about lowering interest rates. So I think that's, you know, kind of a positive sign. Um, you know, globally, I think, you know, a lot still kind of from an oil market perspective, a lot still kind of depends on what's happening with China. Um, and from an oil demand perspective, um, globally, you know, we're expecting generally to see kind of slower demand growth this year. Um, you've kind of gotten that bump from the COVID recovery, and, and now things are kind of moderating from a demand growth perspective. Um, but overall, you know, it seems like the economy is doing okay, but I relate to what you said about you know, people kind of being worried about the rug being pulled out from under them. And you know, as we're talking today, the S&P 500 is hitting a new high. Um, and I think I, I personally feel cautiously optimistic, but would maybe emphasize cautiously. Understood. And, and you know, to your point about the energy component of the global economy, demand, demand growth has slowed down, but there's still growth in demand, right? I mean, how, how much has the demand for oil and energy globally, how much has that demand growth slowed down? Yeah, so I think if you look at the International Energy Agency, which is kind of what everybody uses for global demand data points, I think they're expecting demand to be up 1.2 million barrels per day, which is um, you know, generally kind of what we've seen um, in terms of, you know, if you looked at the years kind of prior to the pandemic, growth around a million or, or 2 million barrels per day is, is probably fairly typical. Um, but that's a bit of a slowdown from 2023. I think the number was more like 2.4 million barrels per day. Um, and a lot of that growth has come from, you know, people actually traveling internationally again, so stronger jet fuel demand, which has kind of been the last um, kind of part of the, of the refined product barrel to, to bounce back from the pandemic. And then you also have, um, you know, improving demand from China. So for demand for this year, you know, China is still very much in the driver's seat. Um, and we'll kind of see how things play out. But to your point, you know, it's still positive demand growth. We haven't need, reached peak oil demand or, or anything like that at this point. So if we could talk about China for a minute. You know, uh, I've heard a lot of, um, I guess, mixed mixed news or mixed analyses of China. 
And, you know, globally, like the U.S. economy, it's it was it was it Warren Buffett or who was it? It's just like never bet against the U.S. economy. And I, I you know, I'm only 40, but I think I've kind of learned that it's like you know, U.S. economy. We're like Rocky, like we can take a million punches and we're just going to get up and, you know, stay in the fight. But I think we're maybe ahead, of, you know, in terms of uh, our economy and how we've recovered and we've had this sort of sustained expansion to your point, S and P is now hitting a new high or at or near a high Friday, February 9th. Um, but a lot of the other countries across the globe are not in as, uh, their economies are not in as strong as position as ours is. And in China, you know, a lot of the news coming out, it sounds like they're in a very precarious situation economically. Um, do, do you have any insight into that or, or, or where, where are we, where are they in terms of energy demand? Well, I think, I think you're right in that you get kind of mixed data points on, on the health of the Chinese economy. I think it tends to be a, a bigger important, a bigger driver for oil demand just because it has historically seen so much growth and you have so much population there and you don't have kind of the per capita barrel you know use in China that we have here in the United States right it's still very small relative to kind of per capita oil use in the US I think so I think that's part of the dynamic is you have a, a middle class kind of growing there you also have a lot of comments around kind of electric vehicles in China and how that plays out over time um, but generally speaking you know China has been such an important kind of growth element of, of oil demand over the last several years that um, it, it, it's hard to ignore, but it is also kind of unclear too in terms of what they're doing. And sometimes it's unclear whether they're, you know, in the past, you know, adding strategic reserves to oil, and so it's inflating their demand. And, it, and data points from China can be just kind of tricky overall. Um, but to contrast that, you know, with the U.S., I think the U.S. economy feels like it's doing fine, um, but you know, we're a more mature economy. We already have high, you know per capita use of, of oil um, and demand here is not going to be seeing the same kind of growth trend. So it, that's a little bit of a contrast, you know, from an oil perspective, uh, places like China, India, much more kind of interesting for demand than your developed markets like the U S or. Europe. Totally. Uh, totally. You know, I want to dig into more of some of these energy markets, the individual markets, because, you know, people might wonder, well, you know, wealth channel, the show here, we're talking about global financial markets. Why are you honing in on energy? But energy really is, it, it certainly is one of the most important components of the economy, right? I mean, I, I might say technology is another, you know, kind of, kind of giant, but the energy markets have the power to spiral us into a recession, right? Like if the, if the wrong shock happens at the wrong time, um, do, do you see any potential shocks like that, you know, really even outside of energy? Do you see any shocks that maybe could potentially surprise people this year? Not that we're saying that will happen, but if you use your imagination and we're in some sort of recession in Q3, Q4, Q1 of next year because of a shock, what what is that shock? Yeah, I think that's a good question. I mean, I think for to your point about a recession, I mean, a recession could be a shock for the oil markets and have negative impacts on, on oil prices and oil demand. Now, uh, it all depends on how severe that is and, and what else is going on in the world. There's been recessions where oil demand is essentially untouched um, and it's not as much of an issue. So to your point, it's, it's difficult to determine, you know, what the impact of a recession could be, but generally people would think it would be negative for oil demand and therefore negative for oil prices and kind of just energy stocks in general. On the upside, I think the potential shock is you know, a worsening situation in the Middle East, mm -hmm. some kind of geopolitical event that maybe we can or, or cannot predict at this point. Um, and that would be you know more of an upside driver for oil prices to the extent that we actually see the you know, oil flows interrupted. I think Sometimes I talk to people and they're like, how is oil only at, you know, $76 a barrel when there's two wars going on in the world and you've got, you know, all the, these other kind of just geopolitical risks hanging out there. Um, and the, the short answer is that we've just got plenty of supply. So maybe we can, you know, talk about that separately. But 
to the extent that we see, you know, geopolitical event that's severely disrupting flows in the world, that would be, you know, a shock that would have, you know, positive implications for oil. Um, but beyond that, it's it's hard to kind of guess. I mean, another COVID would obviously be very bad for oil markets. We've we've lived through that and seen that. Um, but in terms of kind of a short term shock, those are the main things that come to mind. You know, I wouldn't put things like the rising use of alternatives or adoption of electric vehicles in that shock category because those are just, you know, long-term transitions. Right, 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 right. And I want to get to that in a second and talk a little bit about alternative energy. But in terms of the geopolitical shock, you know, that, that could have a huge effect on the energy market, which in turn then could affect the overall economy. We certainly saw that happen to Germany, right, uh, a couple of years ago. Do you think the market is really discounting the risk of that? I mean, I, I guess in the in an academic sense, I guess it is, right? But but do you feel that that, that the market is is discounting that correctly? I suppose. Yeah, I guess I would say I don't feel like there's a lot of a geopolitical risk premium built into oil prices today. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, that goes back to just having ample supplies and nothing so far really impacting you know, global flows. I think you know two years ago we probably would have thought. Russian production and Russian exports would have fallen off more meaningfully than they have. They've held up. Iranian exports have held up better than than maybe some people would have thought. Um, and so you've got just enough barrels sloshing around that um, you know it's hard for people to to build in too much more of a geopolitical risk premium based on what we've seen so far. I love that. There's just enough barrels sloshing around. There's ample supply. Well, that at least right now, right? And this kind of goes the energy market, as we know, it goes in cycles. Last time we talked, um, I asked you about the energy trilemma, you know, which a lot of people are familiar with, um, but not everybody is. And I think to me, it really sets the stage for any discussion about energy markets. It's kind of the almost the framework or the lens that I look at energy markets through. Could you just give us an introduction, you know, for any listeners who who don't haven't heard of the energy trilemma? What what is the energy trilemma? Essentially, it just refers to um, you know, the world's need for low carbon, secure, and affordable energy. So it's really a global issue, um, and there's a lot of different ways that you can solve for that. And you know, some types of energy may be really good in terms of screening as low carbon, but they might be expensive and unpractical for other reasons. Or things may be really cheap, but they're, you know, like coal, for example, but they're maybe, you know, not screening as well from a low carbon perspective. So um, it's it's a big problem, you know, facing the entire world. And, and each country has kind of their own their own issues with that, too, based on what natural resources they have. Um, how developed they are, their grid, all, all these sorts of things. So it's it's a massive issue. Um, and I think from my perspective and, and what we know today and where we're sitting, um, the, the answer is that there's not one size fits all. There's not a silver bullet. It's going to take a lot of different types of energy to meet global demand for energy over the coming years, especially as the global population grows. Mm-hmm. Um, but essentially, the trilemma is just solving for that. How are you going to meet the world's energy needs while keeping it affordable, while minimizing carbon emissions, and you know being able to securely you know provide available energy? Right. So clean, secure, and cheap. It's it's ha- hard to solve for all three variables simultaneously. And every country, every region is going to have a different approach. They're going to be at a different point in their economic development. It reminds me my first internship, my first professional internship, it was in marketing. And my mentor told me, you know, in any market, you got to pick two out of three, good, fast, and cheap. You can be good and fast, you can be good and cheap, or you can be fast and cheap, but you can't be good, fast, and cheap. And I feel like with the energy trilemma, I kind of get that same feeling. You know, it can be clean energy, it can be secure energy, it can be cheap energy. If you get two out of three of those things with any given uh, energy, you know, distribution or production, you're doing okay. It's asking for all three is a really tall order. Is that is that a good way to look at it, Stacy? I think that's fair. It's it's a tall order, and you know, it's also just making sure you have enough energy. 
right? Like it may be um, that you can get, you know, maybe you have a bunch of hydropower and you're getting, you know, a lot of good energy from hydropower. It's cheap, it's clean, but it may only meet so many, much of your energy needs. And so I think what makes it harder is that you have a growing population, growing global demand for energy. And so it's kind of the, the bar is constantly moving higher in terms of how much energy you need overall. So it's not just, okay, we're going to use 100 gigawatts or, you know, and we need to solve for that. It's, it's a constantly moving bar. And so I think that kind of reinforces the, the fact that you're probably going to need a lot of types of energy for a long time. Yeah. And to your point about the moving bar, I mean, really big picture, we have an increasing global population, right? And But, but that is going to peak, you know, all the projections show uh, Malthus was wrong. You know, the idea of the just exploding population, like the, the Earth's population is going to peak and maybe sooner than a lot of people are aware of. But in terms of energy, um, the energy per capita should be increasing for a very, very long time, even after the Earth's population peaks. Is that right? I think that's the right way to think about it. So, you know, you extrapolate what we have here to other parts of the world, developing economies, and, and maybe not to the extreme, extreme of, of the U.S. in terms of energy consumption. But, you know, still, it's, it's you know, people in India driving uh, motorcycles and having more and more motorcycles or, you know, plastics and things like this that we take a, you know, for granted all the time. Um, I think that you know, where you see um, that per capita number change dramatically. And um, again, you know, you can't extrapolate the U.S. to, to everybody else. But, um, you know, over time, you would like people to have a, a higher quality of life, better living standard. And, and energy plays a big part in that. So um, I definitely think that's Kind of a good way to think about the potential upside for just, you know overall energy needs okay well let's dive into these individual markets and obviously your role at vetify you cover mlps you cover natural gas but i, I know that you you know you you keep your fingers on the pulse of the whole energy market but let's start with with natural gas so what's your outlook for 2024 for natural gas bring us up to speed with where we are and, and where do you think it's going to go yeah, so natural gas has had a rough, uh, rough patch for a while, mm -hmm. um, and you know currently we're sitting in February, and it has a one handle from a price perspective. That's that's not good, right? Um, typically, you see stronger pricing for natural gas in, in the winter and the summer as the result of higher, uh, you know, demand for power generation and, and heating demand in the U.S. So it's it's pretty bleak where we're sitting now, um, which in some ways, you know. There's a thought of, well, it can't get too much worse. But <laughs> be, um, Stacey, be careful of saying it can't get worse. Exactly. <laughs> I wouldn't I wouldn't say that. Um, it can always get worse. Yeah. Um, so that might be the temptation. You know, you could argue maybe there's an upside bias eventually, depending on your timeline. Um, but you know, natural gas has just been extremely weak. We've had warm weather. Um, we were talking before the show, you're in Michigan and you were telling me it was a beautiful day outside. That's, yeah. that's not good for natural gas. <laughs> um, and we've been here, you know, in Dallas in the 60s and 70s. Um, right. So that's that's tough. I mean, natural gas is just such a hard commodity because it's so much depends on the weather and it's really not something you can easily predict. Now, in the short term, you know, I don't think there's a lot to get excited about from a natural gas perspective. I think people generally get more constructive into 2025. Um, there's a number of U.S. LNG export projects that should be starting up next year. Um, and, you know, maybe some of those get going in kind of the later stages of 2024. But that's going to drive incremental demand and should, you know, kind of help soak up some of the excess production that we have. Um, in the meantime, prices aren't probably going to do much. And so if you're a natural gas producer, you're probably looking at ways to maybe curb activity um, and kind of slow things down. Uh, but, you know, it's kind of tough because everybody's expecting prices to get better, you know, in about a year or so. So um, it's an interesting kind of dynamic where uh, prices are weak today. They should get better um, as we see these LNG export projects. Uh, eventually start up. But until those come online, there's just not much in terms of a price catalyst for natural gas. So 
Stacy, talk about those LNG export projects. How are those? Are those a shift in the market? Are those something new, or are those just um, building more export capacity? Yeah, so those are you know, new projects that are coming online. Um, Exxon Mobil's um, and Qatar Energy's Golden Pass is, is a good example. Uh, there's a facility called Plaque Mine, so it's starting up. Um, so essentially, you know, U.S. LNG export capacity is, is set to increase pretty meaningfully mm-hmm. um, from about 2025 up till you know 27, 2028. Um, and so that just represents you know incremental demand for U.S. natural gas. And so from a price perspective, should be supportive. Um, should send a signal to producers to you know ultimately produce more natural gas. Um, and and you know, should be a good thing in terms of kind of energy companies, uh, energy markets. Um, but once those come on, it's a phase in to start. It takes time to ramp these facilities up. They're multi-billion dollar facilities. They take years to build. It's not, mm. you know, you flip a switch and here's another two or three billion cubic feet per day of demand. It, it takes some time. Um, but there's, you know, a number of projects starting up in 2025. And so those will kind of stair, lead to kind of a stair step, uh, you know, in U.S. natural gas demand. And so where are we selling? We're exporting LNG, you know, as a nation. So where where does the LNG go when we export it? Um, Europe, Asia, South America. I mean, really, it, it goes all over the place um, okay. in terms of the receiving countries. Um, but, you know, predominantly people tend to focus on kind of the European and Asian markets. But that's by no means the only places. There's certainly a market in South America and Caribbean and other places. So, you know, it. It almost reminds me of uh, like the multifamily real estate market in a way, in the sense that uh, with natural gas, the, the feeling that well, the party's kind of over, you know, <laughs> but we actually think that you know next year or the you know the year after we'll see things bounce back up, you know, asset, you know, and so well, the incentive is just kind of hold on, right? And so, but but that interrupts what would otherwise be a cycle of correction, right? Where certain companies cut production or maybe cancel projects or whatever. I always view energy as kind of self-correcting, right? Where if prices get too high, then, you know, certain projects that maybe weren't economically viable become viable. And then so production capacity increases and then prices come back down. Well, if it goes down too far, then, you know, projects... Is that the right way to look at it? Like, is it is it self-correcting, but it's just kind of maybe messy year to year sort of a thing? Yeah, I think so. I mean, you'll hear people say like, you know, the cure for high prices is our high prices, the cure for low prices is low prices. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's true. You know, in, from a natural gas price perspective, um, to the extent you see producers kind of pull back on activity, that can kind of help. Um we're still probably going to be oversupplied and have a lot of inventory to work down. So it's not necessarily, even if production comes down a bit, it's not necessarily going to be a big lift for, for prices, just kind of depends. Um, but you do see, you know, the market respond to price signals, what's going on to the extent that companies have flexibility. Generally, there's always going to be a lag between, you know, what producers are seeing for oil and natural gas prices. And then, you know, what they can do with their rigs and that sort of thing. But um, to your point, yes, you know, the market generally is pretty good about fixing itself. Um, and, you know, what, what kind of got natural gas into, into trouble is, you know, we didn't have a very good winter last year. It was pretty warm. Um, so started 2023, you know, kind of similar to now, not great pricing. Um, and production just stayed so stubbornly high. And so that's, in some ways, you know, kind of made things worse than if you were to see uh, producers kind of take more drastic step backs in activity. So it's an it's an oversupply. It's it's an oversupply issue in the natural gas market. Well, let's now shift to oil. I mean, are we having the same issue with oil? Where are we with oil prices right now? Yeah. So you know, oil's been kind of bouncing around in the seventy to seventy five. $76, $77 per range, um, you know, for the last couple of months. I think that's something that probably continues. Um, we're in a similar situation. I mean, oil, you know, we're looking more at a global market. Um, and natural gas is global too, in the sense that we can export, but it's a little different. So, 
for the oil market, um, we have ample supplies. You have OPEC plus that has cut production and is you know defending a floor in prices, in my view. Um, but their job gets harder as you have non-OPEC supply coming on. So places like the U.S., Brazil, Guyana, Canada that are probably going to see some production growth this year, um, you know, makes that harder. And then as we talked about, you know, demand's okay, but it's, it's not huge. And so um, from a you know, supply demand standpoint, we probably see, you know, ample supply relative to the demand growth that we're expecting. Um, and that leads to a relatively comfortable market. So I think, you know, to some extent, the OPEC plus cuts and to the degree they continue to cooperate and work together like they have been, you know, probably defends that floor in prices. Um, but I think it's hard to make a lot of upside cases for oil. If you look at projections for this year, I think most people are sitting uh, around, you know, 70 to 75, maybe up to 80 on, on, on the bullish side. Um, but I don't think anybody is really anticipating oil getting to $100 per barrel this year. Um, and again, it kind of goes back to just having plenty of supply, uh, demand being okay, but maybe not um, you know super stellar, um, and that just being kind of just kind of where we are. It's, it's hard to, to see a lot of movement if you've got pretty comfortable supplies. A mediocre, muddy middle of a market, uh, I guess. Um, well, you mentioned OPEC plus. You, you, in your view, they're defending a price floor. What is that price floor? Well, you know, in the past, there's been comments. Mm -hmm. I don't know that it's that specific of a level. Okay, I'm, I'm like looking for the exact floor. I'm like, Stacy, <laughs> I want to know to the dollar and cent what the floor is. Yeah. So it's, it's yeah. that's a round where they're starting to get nervous. Is eighty dollars a barrel, maybe? Well, I think if you kind of go back and look at like last year and when they stepped in and, and done things, you know. We saw oil sell off really hard in the regional banking crisis in you know, March of 2023 as everybody kind of took a risk off mood. Um, and energy stocks, you know, traded so much in line with banking stocks. It was you know, almost bizarre. But, um, you know, you saw them come in in April and do something kind of after that and announce cuts. And so um, back then, you know, oil had dipped kind of into the 60s, if I recall correctly. Um, after you know a really strong 2023 price environment, so you know I'm not saying oh at this level they're going to intervene and you know anything like that, but I do think um, I don't worry as much about downside to prices because I think you know based on their recent track record they're motivated to try and, and come in and and um, you know make adjustments to support the price if prices you know fall too far. So you don't think, well, let me say this. I know that a lot of uh, oil and gas deals, when they do the underwriting, they're underwriting a what, like $60 a barrel oil or something kind of near that range. So you don't think there's any danger that the price of oil could go materially lower than that and put a lot of these deals, you know, they, they could potentially go deeply in the red, right? Yeah, so I mean, if you look at you know oil companies and the long term price forecasts that they'll use for things like that, it's probably yeah sixty to sixty five. I mean, it tends to be pretty conservative. Um, interestingly, I mean, that's kind of where the futures curve is. Mm -hmm. um, you know, keep in mind with these cuts, you've got a lot of kind of excess capacity that's artificially or temporarily offline and, and could come back if needed. So. When you cut production, it helps current prices, but it's almost an overhang on the futures curve. Mm -hmm. And so, like to me, you know, could spot prices go lower than you know sixty or something? You know, it's possible if there's a recession, if there's something going on that's like driving a lot of concern around demand. Um, but I think from you're setting aside a recession and demand and, and focusing on the supply side and what OPEC plus can control. Um, if we see, you know, things weakening, I think they're going to be responsive to prices. Now, if they don't cooperate and they sometimes have trouble getting everybody to agree, then, then that floor um, becomes less secure. 
And then you're kind of really, you know, waiting to see really what Saudi Arabia does, right? They're, they're the ones that have been, you know, the most proactive in terms of cuts and, and really kind of leading the way. So um, it, it becomes almost more dependent on, on what they're going to do if the broader group starts to have um, some potential issues within themselves. Understood. So we can we can pretty much count on that price floor until we can't, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, it's as good as you know. It's as good as it lasts. Um, I get it. Yeah. But that's one thing I love about the energy market is is on the one hand we're talking about you know you could be talking about scientific concepts and production and uh, geology in one sentence, and then the next you're talking about macro and interest rates and the stock market. And then in the next, you're talking about, you know, wars and geopolitical things. And so um, it's a wild card type market where, you know, it, 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 it is in some ways it's very predictable, but like, but, but also any kind of curveball globally can make it go totally haywire, right? Like we saw with COVID, like COVID caused all sorts of sectors of the economy to go haywire. But certainly with energy, it was maybe the most dramatic, really, of any sector or or one of the most dramatic, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, you have, there's not been an event like that where you just see oil demand disappear overnight because people are staying at home. And mm-hmm. I think for 2020, oil demand was down like eight or nine million barrels per day. Um, and in the depths of you know, March and April, it was, it was way more than that. Um, and yeah, it's just, it's a crazy type of shock to the system that's you know, one of those kind of black swan events. Um, but, you know, when you come out of that, then you kind of frame things against it. Like electric vehicles aren't going to be like that. You know, all these other things that people worry about for like oil demand are not going to be that sort of, con- um, you know, quick, terrible shock to the system where you have just demand disappear overnight. Um, so it definitely had an extreme, extreme impact on the energy space. Totally. Well, and, and Stacy, I wanted to follow up on on one other comment you made. You know, you, you mentioned it's hard to make the upside case for oil right now. And you mentioned, you know, probably not likely to break that hundred dollar price barrier. But when when you say it's hard to make the upside upside case for oil, you mean this year in 2024? Is that yeah. Okay. Yeah, more specific to 2024. Like, if you just, you know, are looking at the fundamentals, there's just doesn't seem to be enough there to to really see a lot of upside because we have plenty of supply to meet the expected demand. So, um, you know, you can't really make an upside case based on, well, I think this war is going to escalate into this and we're going to see this and this and Iran sanctions are going to be stricter. You know, it, it, it becomes um, uh, a little more far-fetched to try and make right. an upside story if, if that's, you know, if you're trying to base it on some kind of geopolitical event or, or risk that's, you know, very difficult to predict. Totally. Well, let's let's then zoom out. So I, I, I think I have a handle then on 2024, even past 2025 to more of a five- 10 year timeline um do you think that energy supply has sort of caught up energy supply and and growth the growth rate in energy supply if if, well well, actually let me ask this is 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 that growing is oil production growing right now like year over year do you see it growing in the next several years so um it has been um, I think key differentiators from kind of what we've been seeing to what we will see in the next decade is that U.S. energy production is not going to grow as much as it did. Okay. Um, you know, you look back at like 2018, U.S. production, oil production was up like 2 million barrels per day. Right. Um, you know, we're not going to see that extreme amount of growth. And I think generally, if you look at expectations for this year, it's, it's more flattish. For U.S. production, it's you know up year over year on an average basis, but if you're looking at kind of the exit to exit rate, it's generally you know more flat. So, um, I think you know there's certainly the potential that we see production growth. I think we're going to see demand grow, um, and like through that period, I, I don't think demand is going to peak in the next five years 
or in the next 10 years. Um, so it's likely that we will see, um, you know, both demand and production grow. Where that growth comes from, though, is, is kind of the interesting part and, and how much of it is unwinding cuts from the past um, and, you know, new discoveries, things like that. So I would say generally I would expect both demand and production to grow, um, but we'll see what happens. You know, something that's been really topical in the energy space lately is you know, Saudi Arabia announced plans that they weren't going to, or, you know, they're pausing plans to add another million barrels per day of capacity. Um, Saudi capacity is, is always kind of a, um, a black box in some ways. They say it's 12 million barrels per day. People in the energy space tend to maybe think it's lower based on what they've actually produced historically. But, you know, the idea was that they were going to add another million barrels per day of capacity. And now people are looking at that. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of different ways you can take that. Do they just not want to spend the money right now? Do they not think the demand is going to be there? Um, is this a clean energy issue? You know, there's just a lot of... Um, uh, questions that you you can kind of take from that and, and maybe read into too much or, um, you know, it, it could be mixed signals depending on kind of what your agenda is. Um, so that's something I think that's, that's also very interesting. Um, maybe those plans come back and they do look to, you know, add another million barrels per day of capacity and then they're contributing to that growth. Um, but we'll see, you know, five, 10 years out is, is always so hard. Um, nobody's ever right, and I'll, I'll admit that myself. I'm I'm probably not right, but uh, high level, I would see both you know demand and supply growing. So so yeah, and and you know I'm not asking I for precise uh, prediction really. I guess I'm more we're going to see demand for oil rise over the next ten years. We're going to see, but supply production capacity will also increase. And so just it's a it's a matter of uh, which increases faster or do they both increase at exactly the same rate, right? Do you think it's do you think it's more likely that there's upward pressure along the way on oil prices or or downward pressure? Well, I think, you know, broadly speaking, I think we'll be in an up cycle for oil for a while yet. I think, you know, these cycles tend to last, you know, several years and you know, technically we're probably in year three of an up cycle, if you kind of say it started coming out of the pandemic and then kind of 2021. So from that standpoint, I think, you know, broadly I would be constructive um, on, you know, prices over the next, you know, five, 10 years, but um, with a caveat that there'll probably be a lot of volatility and, you know, of course. not being very bullish on prices in the near, near term. Well, uh, I know we're almost out of time, um, but but one more thing I want to pick your brain on. Is there any aspect of the energy market, any trend, new story playing out this year that you think has gone below the radar that's been underreported, you know, from the investor standpoint, you know, really from that financial standpoint? Because, you know, I, I think some of these big stories, the energy trilemma, the you know, the fact that, you know, LNG exports maybe can grow. Some of the stuff gets reported by the media, but I think there's a ton going on that's kind of under the radar. So, you know, is there is there anything you could share that, you know, a trend or, or you know, that's really playing out right now that you think a lot of people just aren't aware of? Um, you know, it's a good question. I mean, I mentioned the, mentioned the Saudi Arabia thing. That was a big deal for oil field service stocks. But if you aren't really paying attention to, to those names, then you probably wouldn't have even had that on your radar. I mean, I think that's a good example of something that's been kind of timely. The other kind of um, notable news from an LNG perspective is you know, the Biden administration deciding to kind of pause uh, approvals for new LNG export facilities. So, um, you know, people have different views on it. Um, U.S. LNG export capacity is set to grow a lot. Um, the projects that have already been approved and under construction are impacted, mm -hmm. but you know this likely delays those projects that are kind of waiting on on those approvals. Um, it it feels very much like a political move in an election year, and I think it probably gets resolved after the election. You know, regardless of who wins. Um, well, Stacy, that's, that's 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 interesting though because I'm yeah. thinking. 
you know, uh, President Trump, the Trump administration, obviously very friendly to energy producers and the Biden administration less so. But are those sorts of policy decisions by the Biden administration? I mean, are they potentially helping to um, lift the price, you know, lift commodity prices or or keep them in a, in a little bit of a higher range? Well, I mean, there's two different elements of this. So for LNG customers, less U.S. supply would presumably mean higher prices for the global customers. The other side of it is if you're, you know, a U.S. citizen or you're a domestic manufacturing company that uses natural gas, et cetera, you may like this because uh -huh. if there's less LNG export capacity, that may mean lower prices here. Mm -hmm. So there's kind of two sides to every coin. Um, and, and so I'm, I don't think, I don't want to say the pause doesn't have any merit to look at things like economic impact on, on the U.S., um, you know, environmental issues and things like that. Um, but the timing and the, the way these things come out, is, it's, you know, it ultimately feels very you know, political. Um, and so, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens there. But, you know, what we've seen or what I've seen, at least in the energy space over the years is regardless of the administration, whether it's oil friendly and they're trying to open oil drilling in new places or it's, um, not as friendly to oil and gas and they're trying to restrict drilling in certain places a lot of times that stuff just ends up in the courts and you end up with kind of a status quo eventually it may take some time there may be some delays and, and some things that um cause headaches along the way but seems like ultimately these things end up as status quo but in the term in the case of lng exports it's just a tough a tough walk because you've got you know, allies in Europe who want to buy more U.S. LNG potentially, and it, what message does this send them? Um, and you've got, you know, kind of the environmentalists on the other side who, you know, want to see this pause. Um, and then, unfortunately, you've got the company stuck in the middle who, meanwhile, are kind of just waiting. Right. And you have competitors in other countries that are having this issue. I mean, it's interesting, like, we've got, you know, uh, LNG projects in Mexico that are going to be sourced with U.S. gas, and if something like this isn't going to impact them. Um, so, anyways, it's just an, an interesting dynamic, and I don't know if people broadly would pay much attention to it because it's such an energy-specific issue. Right. Yeah, and and I don't think energy is is the top issue, obviously, in the 2024 election. But it, but it, but it is in this industry. You know, the election and. Um who's in the White House, which party controls the White House, which party controls Congress. Those are big issues for this industry. Stacey, I'll, I'll have to have you back on in September or October. We can do like a big episode just covering the election <laughs> policy and politics. That could get really interesting. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't know if that sounds like fun or not. Uh, I kid, yeah, I, I, I kid. <laughs> We're almost out of time, but uh, Stacey, you have wonderful writing and coverage of the energy industry and of, of MLPs, natural gas. So where can our audience of investors go to keep up with your commentary? Well, thanks, Annie. That's very nice. Um, you can find our research on uh, etftrends.com. If you uh, just toggle down on the channels button, there's an energy infrastructure channel. Um, and so we talk about macro topics like oil and natural gas, but also focus a lot on the energy infrastructure space, um, ways investors can access the space, how it works in portfolios, things like that. So, um, you know, hopefully it's a helpful resource for investors who are trying to learn more about the space. Awesome. And, and again, I, I love the coverage from Vetify, the energy channel, all the coverage from Vetify. And by the way, congratulations to the whole Vetify team on the recent uh, acquisition by TMX. So that's very exciting news for you all. Uh, and Stacy, thanks again for joining the show today. No, thanks so much for the conversation and for having me.